Hello everyone and welcome to the July event of the San Francisco Computational Design Institute. My name is Enrico Chionna and I'm one of the organizers here at SFCDI. And today we are honored to, to have three amazing speakers. Matthew Gilbert, a professor uh, from the University of <laughs> Sheffield in UK. And Emily Ullman, uh, as well as uh, Matthew Hoppe, uh, who some of you might remember from last time from last month's event. So before uh, diving into their presentations, we're gonna uh, go through some announcements and general news. Um, so we invite you to check our website at ssfcdi.org for new events uh, and upcoming news, uh, as well as our Twitter account. A couple of announcements. Um, Next month presentation will be on August 12th, which is uh, Wednesday at noon. And um, we still have our logo competition on, so please um, check out our website at sfcdi.org slash logo dash competition. Um, the deadline is August 12th. We're trying to revamp our logo. Anyone is welcome to join in the, in the competition and we will be giving away uh, first prize of $500 sponsored by Autodesk, uh, which we, we thank for the support. The speakers in the next event will be Arturo Tedeschi, uh, who's an amazing computational designer, and Phil Langley, director at Brighton Wood. And we want to thank our sponsors, uh, Autodesk and Gensler, for uh, their continuous support. And finally, we get to our presentation. Uh, today we have two presentations. The first one will be Professor Matthew Gilbert um, talking about design optimization uh, in building structures, followed by Emily Ullman and Michael Hoppe um, talking about VR, AR, 3D, 360 uh, in real estate. So um, I would like to leave the stage to Matthew first. Um, and I hope, Matthew, you can tell us a couple of things about yourself. Uh, I didn't want to expand too much on your introduction because I wouldn't do you justice. So I'll let the stage to you. Um, I'll make you presenter right now. Thanks very much, Enrico. So um, as Enrico uh, suggested, I'm from the University of Sheffield in the UK. Um, just uh, share my correct screen. Just give me a second. Um, and the reason I'm I'm here is because we've recently completed a UK government funded research project, and uh, we're keen to, to share some some outcomes. Um, the aim of the work was really to make accessible um, to the community tools to allow structural designers, but also potentially architects to design building structures that use less material, so more carbon uh, efficient structures. Okay. So before I get into the, the presentation proper, I'm just gonna just sh show an example. This is um, zooming in on a uh, part of a uh, hotel redevelopment. So what we have is um, a below ground level um, ballroom that's planned and we have three stories um, of, of structure available to put structure, and then we're going to put a large block of, um, of hotel um, rooms above that. So the spans are quite large, around 50, 50 meters. And we have um, from transverse beams, large loads coming in to the, uh, um, into this potential structure that's occupying three stories of, of the building. The question is, what is the best structure to to occupy that space um, the designers worked out what, what a sensible structure might look like um, they basically connected the supports to each of the loads and we end up with this warren truss like structure and the weight of, of one of these trusses was 463 tons so we got involved in the project and um, using mathematical optimization we came up with a very different looking structure um, less than half the weight but a problem is 
it would be incredibly difficult to to build that that structure lots and lots of um, very fine thin members and um, using normal fabrication techniques that would be very very difficult to um, to make and that's really where structural optimization has been for 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 decades that that doesn't seem to be uh, a way of getting um, these very academic looking structures into the hands of designers such that they can actually make use of, um, of that, that technology. In this particular case, we uh, used uh, methods that we've, we've developed to identify a, um, a simpler structure than the middle one, not quite as simple as the top one, but what you can see is that we have managed to, to arrive at a, a solution which is only relatively um, slightly um, above the, 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 the weight of the, of the middle structure, so 13% heavier, um, and is potentially buildable. And so what we're really interested in doing is having um, or making available automated tools that allow designers to quickly come up with these, these kind of options so that potentially you can significantly reduce the um, the carbon footprint of your structures. If you're interested in this particular structure, there is uh, there's a paper about it um, published relatively recently. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about some of the methods that are available and some of the methods that we've developed in the project. I'm going to be talking about um, how we um, can trust the solutions and how we can we can relate this, the, the, the current solution to a benchmark look at buildability constraints uh, of the sort that clearly uh, were relevant in the previous example, look at some of the tools that we've developed during the course of the project, and then finally look at some, some applications. So first of all, methods. Um, now, this this area, um, the particular area I'm interested in is, is, is called layout optimization. So it's, it's finding the best layout, for example, of a truss to carry forces back to, um, supports and some really nice work done more than 100 years ago by an Australian engineer called Mitchell um, so here we have a, a vertical load at A and a, and a circular support at B and this was the the most efficient the lightest or minimum volume truss to carry that load back to support and what he found was that uh, in, a, in an optimal structure tension and compression members are at, at 90 degrees to each other about uh, 50 years or 60 years later, exactly 60 years later, in fact, some American mathematicians um, came up with a method of doing this using uh, a computer. So the idea is that you have a design space, you populate that design space with nodes, you connect those nodes with potential truss bars in this case, and then you use optimization techniques to find the minimum volume subset of members forming the optimal structure. And uh, a frighteningly long period of time ago, actually, 2003, we of um, 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 identifying these these solutions more quickly. So, in terms of um, available methods, um, one of the things that we've done to make the solutions from the 1960s approach more um, useful is we've developed a what we call a geometrical optimization technique so what we do is we start off with a, a messy solution from the layout optimization um, process and then we move the the nerds around to improve the solution so this is a, um, a secondary or post processing step to simplify the, 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 the solution and make it a little bit more rational but also um, lighter um, one of the other problems with these solutions that we get from um, the 1960s method is um, we don't impose stability, so um, we can have um, overall buckling of um, the, the, the structure, and we've developed uh, methods for dealing with that, that too. Um, the figure you can see on screen is not great, um, but um, the, the upper the upper view is a series of effectively parallel trusses with no connections between them. When you take account of stability, then there is basically bracing between those parallel trusses. 
Um, unfortunately, it does make things a bit slower, but um, sometimes uh, clearly it's essential. And the other thing that we've been looking at is, is not just trusses, but also um, floor plates. So um, in a building, we typically have arrangements of beams laid out uh, in a particular pattern, but uh, the patterns that we typically use are not necessarily optimal. So it's an interesting solution here. If you have um, a design domain, which is now um, a, a, a sort of a flat plate on plan, we've got an upward load and a downward load. We've got four column potential supports. You think that the best solution was simply a beam from um, the, the top left column to the top right column, and then another beam at the lower part of the domain, uh, two beams to, um, to take those loads. Actually, if you use optimization, we end up with this much more complex pattern of, of beams to carry um, the, the loading. This one's a bit artificial, it's not very practical, but it just shows you that uh, um, we can end up getting surprising solutions if we use optimization. So I said I'd say a few words about benchmarking. Um, what we can do at the limit is get really, really accurate solutions. And so we get numerical solutions, which are very, very close to analytical solutions. Um, in this particular case, I've not shown the structure, but you can see the errors of 0.000% difference between the analytical and the numerical, the one below 0.001%. So we get really, really uh, close estimates. And that means that we have a solution that we can we can we can compare other solutions with. Um, the downside is that these 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 benchmarks um, are not structures that you'd want to use in practice. So this is a, a, another highly impractical um, problem. Uh, so sorry, solution where we've got lots and lots of elements in in tension and compression, lots and lots of issues. Um, that we we might need to uh, what we would like to need to deal with in in a construction pro project. In a smaller scale project, additive, additive manufacturing is is moving the dial a little bit. We can potentially make more complex structures than we could in the past, but even even so, this would be a, this would be a real challenge. So what we really need uh, are buildability constraints to move from that very very impractical benchmark to something more realizable in the real world. Um, there are methods of doing that. Um, one of the, the methods is called mixed interlinear programming, where we basically have on-off variables to represent um, the um, individual members. And we can make some strides in that direction, but uh, using, using that method, but it's still quite expensive. So what we propose is, that we use um, a two-step procedure. So we start off with that highly impractical um, but globally optimal solution for, for the, the idealized case. And then we, we move to a nearby solution. Some of these solutions will be locally optimal, but we know how close they are to that benchmark. If on the other hand, you use what's been common in the, in the industry, in, in AEC sector, use meta-heuristic methods or genetic algorithms and the like, you've got no idea where you are relative to that global optimum. Also, it's very likely that that local optimum is a long way away from being globally optimal. So we think there's some benefits. And uh, what we've um, done in this particular slide that you can see on screen, this two-stage method is we've used um, um, an alternative to this mixed interlinear programming method um, where we've got a smooth approximation of these uh, on-off variables and we, we can move from this very messy benchmark on the left to a simplified version just in a few seconds or even a hyper-simplified solution if we want to. The trade-off is something that we need to keep an eye on. There's 0.2% volume increase in that middle one but 30% volume increase or 32% volume increase in the in the right hand side one. So um, available software tools. Um, how can uh, you get your hands on this 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 stuff? Um, there's a, a, for those of you who are programmers, there's a Python script that we've released that that, that does the layout optimization. 
Um, also, as of about two weeks ago, um, or three weeks ago, we've got a web app, which um, allows you to basically just go straight to the website layup.com and just enter in any problem that you might want. You can get these classical optimal structures, but you can also use um, simplification techniques I've just mentioned to actually simplify the, the problem. So it's a really good way um, of getting to grips with the particular problem that you're dealing with in a, in a kind of different way to what you would normally do at the concept design stage. So you can have lots of fun. Um, so put aside half an hour um, when you're drinking a cup of coffee to, to have a play and uh, um, find uh, some surprising results very often. Um, so it still surprises me <laughs> and I've been using it for some, some time prior to release. So um, don't go now though, because we've got some interesting presentations to do to cover. So uh, but note it down and go, go after this session. And then probably the, the solution, the tool that's probably of most interest uh, to people here is um, a, a Rhino Grasshopper plugin called Peregrine that we've developed, which can be downloaded from Food for Rhino via the following, uh, via, by the link shown, um, so slash app slash Peregrine. And what we basically do in this uh, this tool is um, set up a, a problem and then do the lay optimization and then there are various options for the rationalization of the sort that we've we've just seen. Um, I think I've got a very, very, um, uh, how, how can I put it? Um, um, well, an unrealistic, it's, it's not really a building, it's just showing, showing um, you know, how we can um, um, get a problem set up and solved. So if we, we in that previous uh, clip, we actually had um, parametric variation of points. We're now setting up loads and supports, um, linking those into the, the, the Peregrine solver there. And then what that means is that you can go to um, you know, Grasshopper controls and you can change the positions of some of these um, loads or supports and for this problem certainly in real time you can see how the um, uh, the optimal structure varies so it's a little bit like um, layup.com in this particular case in that you can very quickly and easily see what's going on but it's, it's a little bit uh, academic a little bit artificial um, I'll come up with a little bit more um, practical one in a, in a couple of minutes so applications, um, so one application um, that we looked at was single and multi-story buildings. Um, we've got some interesting outcomes. Um, it's a couple of papers there shown on screen if you're interested. But one of the things that we were slightly surprised about was, was, was how little um, the, the layout of the bracing affected the material. So we might find a, a mathematically optimal solution as bracing that looks like the um, example shown on screen, but it didn't make a huge difference compared with conventional cross bracing or knee bracing, for example. But interesting nonetheless. However, when we um, combined the the truss optimization for the bracing and, and for the columns and grillage optimization for the floors, we got some some quite different um, results and, and, and much bigger benefits from using optimization. So um, this is a really a, sort of an artificial um, building. It's just got I think it's ten story, but just four um, just one bay basically. So very very simple. Um, and we're designing both the the bracing, so you can see these these kind of um, orthogonal um, patterns in the in the bracing. And then at the bottom, we've got the floor plan of the um, the grillage for basically for the floor plate. And the interesting thing that that you can notice is what it does is it doesn't um, have a fog, um, 90 degree um, elements, um, 90 degree to the the face of the building. It actually rotates things around through 45 degrees, and it puts a lot of load down through columns that are positioned centrally. 
at each face of the building. Um, if, on the other hand, we decide that we, we really don't want that um, 45 degree, and we, and we, and we insist that, that it's 90 degree to the face of the building, but still have um, um, the, the grid optimization um, there, then we end up um, something that's a, a little bit higher. So this, the volume of material for this middle building is now 14% higher. But if we compare that with a conventional building using cross bracing and using primary and secondary beams, then the jump is quite significant. So it's three times as much material in the building on the right as the building on the left, which is uh, you know, quite interesting um, and, and probably quite surprising to, to many uh, uh, designers. Um, this is um, a, a version of Peregrine. It's not yet released, but it's gonna be hopefully released in September um, where we, we can do the, um, the combined grillage and um, and truss optimization and so then we can start to to put in um, you know potential building concepts in there we can set up the different um, areas so we state what's what's a what's a grillage and what's what's, what's going to take trusses and then we can um, basically solve the problem this particular one um, because it's got it's, it's a slightly larger scale um, it doesn't solve in a second, it solves in about five or 10 seconds. So you can see the progress on screen, but still not a huge amount of time considering the, um, um, you know, the insights that potentially this could um, um, give to you as a designer. Um, actually takes quite a long time just to update the solution as well. Um, that's what it's doing now. And I think we just change it into green so we can see the, um, the design is probably not that clear, but the, the green members are the members that have been designed using optimization. And we can see again, this pattern for the grillages on the top. It's a little bit difficult to see the, um, um, the bracing members in the, in, the, uh, in the facades. But potentially this kind of tool um, could uh, open up um, you know, some interesting um, concepts for, for, for designers and potentially and what we're particularly keen on obviously is it reduce um, material by a significant amount um, and then this final example I've got here is actually not one of my examples we've worked closely with um, a number of industry partners in particular Arup um, and um, these are slides from one of the designers Vincenzo Reale um, who um, applied the, the plug-in to um, the concept design of uh, a stadium roof. So I've got a base shape there shown on screen, We're dividing that up in a, a varying degree of uh, subdivisions. And um, you can see um, on the right, the um, a, 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 an optimized solution. And if you change the number of subdivisions, you can get a whole range of different solutions, um, or, or you know, clearly a family of solutions that got, clearly look have got similarities to each other. Um, I see more on on screen there, and um, here's comparing the, the the simplest one with the most complex one. And also interesting just to look at in detail at some of the um, the concepts that are proposed. It may be that you don't um, you don't use this tool other than to get some ideas for a manual design at this stage, but it's still you know quite interesting to to, to go through that process. Um, I think that's uh, all I'm got time to say. So. Um, we think numerical optimization is, is a powerful technique. We've been working hard for the last uh, three or four years to, to basically fill in some of the, uh, or uh, amend, uh, or address some of the issues that have prevented it being useful in, in practice. So hopefully we've done that to, uh, um, to some extent. And uh, I guess the proof of the pudding is in, in you, um, as the community actually trying um, the tools that we've developed uh, and uh, seeing how you get on with them. So please have a play, particularly with the, um, the Layopt web app, just for 
getting to grips with structural optimization and uh, also Peregrine available at Food for Rhino um, now. Um, just say a couple of acknowledgements. So the, the, the work was funded by the UK government through one of our, their um, research councils called EPSRC. Um, the project involved um, many colleagues um, from the University of Sheffield, but also from the University of Bath and Edinburgh. Um, too many to, to to cite, but all made contributions, plus a, a number of um, industry partners. If you're interested in that project, you can go to buildop.org and find out uh, more about it. So I think that's uh, that's me. Um, any questions? Thank you, Matthew. Thank you very much. Uh, incredible tools. Uh, really amazing. You know the layout, of the optimization that they're creating and the amount of work that they're, the problems that they're solving uh, on behalf of humans, uh, it, it's it's amazing. Um, I don't see any questions at, th at this time, but invi I invite the audience to submit their questions and we can come back to them later at the end of the presentation. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to um, pass the microphone to Emily Ullman and I'm going to make, make a presenter so she can get started with her presentation. Thank you, Emily, and welcome. Hello. So, um, let's see here. Just a moment. Okay, so uh, I am Emily Ullman. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, as well, um, Professor Gilbert. That was an amazing um, talk about all of your work, and I think just I know that there there'll, there'll be plenty of questions at the end, but I, I'm so amazed to see how much the simplification of difficult processes and sort of um, very dense um, 3D objects, if you will, um, can be simplified using computers. And it's very much relevant to the work that that I do with scanning, uh, because you know the simplification of polygons is very much um, a, a similar. Um, a similar objective. Um, so let me just go into a quick introduction about myself. Um, and can you see my screen? Yes, I can. You can see my screen. Okay. And let's see here. I'm losing the uh, go to meeting though. Let's see. Ah. Okay. Well, I'll just go into the keynote then. Let's see. Showing main screen. Show main screen. Okay. All right. So, uh, so anyway, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today and to present to SFCDI and again um, to everybody who's a part of this organization. Um, I it's an honor to be invited to chat with you today and uh, a little bit about myself. I am the founder. Um, and chief photographer at a company called Hopscotch Interactive. And I started the company five years ago, um, initially to do real estate marketing using 3D photography with the Matterport system. Um, I became very interested in uh, the Matterport technology and um, how I could use it to sort of transport people to a space uh, using 3D scanning and virtual tours. Um, and um, this led me down a very, very interesting sort of career change. Um, I had been working in uh, media and advertising prior to that, um, but I actually had not been sort of so hands-on with creating content and trying to create new things um, out of the out of the creative work that I was doing. Um, this led me to in, a very deep interest in uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. And I also founded another company called Spatial First, which, which builds upon 3D photography and uh, 3D visualization and attempts to create a new uh, interface for um, you know, interacting with 3D content and maps. Um, I also am the prop tech chair of the um, Crepin Group, which is the Commercial Real Estate Professionals Network in San Francisco. And I'm on the advisory council for AWE, which is Augmented World Expo, and I run the San Francisco um, meetup, um, as well as um, volunteering my time for XR Marin's Leadership Council, which tries to bring 
um, XR education to secondary um, secondary school and even younger um, students here as a model for um, education around the country to, to teach younger people about XR. So I'm very interested in XR and sort of all the things that it enables. Um, this is an example of a Matterport um, output, a 3D scan, a reality capture done using the Matterport system. And I'm going to speak to, about Matterport a lot today because it's the system I've been using for five years, and I think that it is um, it is it's very interesting in particular now how Matterport has um, as a solution for reality capture become something that is way more accessible, more affordable, um, and can be used in the design process um, in a way that it wasn't used before or hasn't been done at scale. Um, I was so fascinated by it because early on I was able to take um, stereoscopic images that I had created with um, my Matterport scanner and to create sort of seamless VR experiences, even though it was just for um, Gear VR um, and wasn't exactly like a sixth-off experience, um, you know, with, with hand controllers and all of that and being able to, to truly explore the space. Um, I was so excited about this this idea of being able to step inside of a place that I was not, um, or to be able to share that with someone. Um, so I, I spent the last five years really, um, you know, exploring this deeply and spending a lot of time thinking about um, visualization and not coming at it from the architect standpoint, because that's not my training, but coming at it from more of the marketer standpoint and from this uh, standpoint of spatial computing, how can we, you know, how can we start to visualize um, a space when we're not there? And what are the extended versions of that? Not just showing a 360 or wearing a, a headset for VR, but also being able to, um, you know, visualize that space in, in your living room or on site to be able to show things that aren't actually there. So this, we'll talk about this in a minute. Um, but now with uh, our post-COVID world, um, I just wanted to sort of give you a glimpse into my uh, very much daily activities. So um, here I am in a space that we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, just, you know, gloves, masks, it's super hands-on. Uh, we make glamorous things, but the work itself is not exactly super glamorous, but it is really, um, it is fun and I really enjoy it a lot. So um, that's me um, working on a very large scanning project. Um, and just to to kind of take us back in time, you know, in 2018, there was a, um, a marketer survey that asked specifically for commercial real estate, you know, what are the things that you're going to use this year? And virtual reality and 3D tours sort of ranked at the very bottom of the list. So roughly about 13 percent said, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll dabble in it. But it wasn't something that they considered to be essential. So move forward to, um, this was about a month ago, a survey I did on LinkedIn, just kind of polling the audience, um, you know, and uh, were virtual tours for real estate essential to your marketing strategy prior to COVID-19? And it sort of didn't matter what they had done before. Um, it was um, basically very clear to me that everyone sees this as now essential. So if everyone sees it as essential, um, how has that changed things? And so I just kind of want to share with you sort of last year to this year um, at Hopscotch, I did a lot of uh, Hopscotch Interactive. I did a lot of residential scanning um, prior to COVID. Now that um, uh, coronavirus and lockdown has happened, the commercial real estate industry, which is typically very lagging, um, you know, they have rapidly adopted the use of 3D scanning um, for marketing, for virtual tours, and it's really started to become the, the sort of, um, you know, standard that they expect um, for real estate tours. So just in 2020, you know, la the whole of last year, we maybe did 100,000 square feet. So very, very small amount of commercial real estate space was scanned that I worked on. Um, but just in the last uh, couple of months, um, we have since COVID, I should say it's not even 2020 to date. It's it's really since COVID, um, we've scanned over a half a million, getting close to almost a million square feet um, just in the recent months. And those are bigger scanning projects um, that what's interesting is that the demand has increased. It's increased for documentation. It's increased for marketing. But it also means that the amount of 3D data that is now available and out there that can be used for XR projects 
is a staggering amount. And people, I think, don't even realize this. Um, so the question I, have, I want to ask to everyone is, you know, if the built environment tells a story, um, but what story do we want to tell with it? And that's where we get the opportunity to use spatial computing and some of these techniques to do new things. Um, and it also leads me to sharing my 3D philosophy with you. So um, it's all about the polygons. It's all about the three dimensions. So because we capture in 3D, this enables us to use that data and to share it um, you know, with designers or if we're able to do it ourselves um, to, to create more turnkey experiences for showcasing space. And again, this is Un, uh, this is for the built environment primarily. The unbuilt environment, it has a, a long history of uh, visualization, but the built environment has a harder time somehow um, communicating itself in 3D. Um, usually you just go there, but we can't go there right now. We're really limited in what we're able to do. Um, so here's, so, for example, um, one of the spaces that I shot. It might be some place that some of you recognize and may not have even been to since uh, the shutdown. This is uh, One Bush, which is where HOK is headquartered. Um, and I did do a large scanning project um, at One Bush um, during the coronavirus, um, so during lockdown, um, as part of um, trying to assist uh, the building owners and Tishman Spire to uh, to create a way to um, enable um, the leasing team to still to still function. Um, and as you can see, you know, one of the things that I have always think of when I think of it as a photographer, it's like, okay, here, this could be anywhere. I don't know where I am. If I zoom out, um, I'm suddenly able to have much greater context for where I am. Now I know I'm at one bush. Now I can see um, exactly where we are. Um, and so I'm going to also just take you into, um, just to sort of continue on the theme of greater context, um, you know, here I am now inside of a suite. So we were here at the building entrance. I know this is me outside of, of One Bush. And um, now I'm here inside the lobby, you know, um, and if I actually now drop into the suite, um, what what I've enabled, and what's nice about this is this is an empty suite, so I've enabled the ability to tour around uh, and look at something that isn't there um, in a very immersive way. And this is not the, I would say this is super exciting, of course, but, but where I think you're going to kind of get where we're going with this is when we show you what we can do after we have done the reality capture and created the 3D model. So um, let me go back to this. So when you scan a space that is furnished, so or has already been fit out, obviously there's a lot more, um, you know, there's a lot more artifacts in that scan. Um, this is scanned with an infrared scanner. It's not a laser scanner, uh, um, but this is, it, for example, what it looks like in reality. Um, so you can see there's still quite a bit of artifacts and uh, sort of 3D noise that's in there. Uh, but here is that same scan I was showing you before. This is the 3D data, and, and this was sort of a, a quickly scanned space, um, as opposed to here's what it looks like in reality capture. Um, and you know, at this point, uh, this is uh, this is something that we could already use to create a more immersive 3D visualization for any client uh, or for any project where we need to really illustrate um, sort of efficiently and quickly uh, what we could do with the space. Um, so if, let's see, is Mike, um, is his microphone on? Yeah, I'm here. Um, so I'd like to sort of um, have Mike jump in here. Are you able to screen share? Yes. Okay, I think I just have to be given permission to share. I'm going to give it to you, Mike. Perfect. So Mike is with GeoPogo, and GeoPogo is um, somebody that many of you may have already heard speak uh, last month um but we are both alums of the or he's actually still currently at berkeley skydeck in the accelerator program and we are um colleagues from the um from the um, vr community um, in san francisco and so you know we've started to collaborate a little bit to sort of bring our work a little bit closer and illustrate some of these things so hi mike hey how are you guys fantastic okay so um 
I might turn off my camera just for um, bandwidth, um, but I'll just keep this really short. So we've presented um, at the last SFCDI event, we presented Geopogo, augmented reality, and what we do for architects and builders uh, to better present their designs for client approval and design review. So a little about me, uh, I'm the creative director at Geopogo. And so I've worked in architecture, graduated in 2010, and I specialized in 3D uh, visualization, be it virtual reality or augmented reality. So in today's presentation and going on what um, Emily is discussing, we're gonna work with one of her projects um, that she scanned. So this is a 3D model of an office space that she scanned. And here, give me one second. I'm just gonna turn this rendering off, my apologies. There we go. That'll make it a little smoother. Okay. There we go. I'm asking my computer to do too many things. <laughs> totally. No matter how powerful. Sorry, Emily, go ahead. I was just gonna say, this is a different space than the one I was showing before, but this is, yes, this is another yeah. scan um, that we did um, also with Spatial First. Um, uh, I'll get into that in a second, but I definitely, yeah, this is a, an OBJ. In particular, this one was scanned um, to try to get a good, clean OBJ, as clean yeah. as we could get, even though we had open ceilings and et cetera. But it was already, this one was already built out. And I'm just going to see if I can close Maya just to get Maya to relax my computer settings. Sorry, guys. It's a Razer computer, so you do expect it to to be able to do some some things, but not yeah. everything. Okay, so that should close in just a minute. Okay, so when we take in Emily's OBJ models, we can start to do what's called virtual staging. And so virtual staging is fantastic because as we know in architecture, um, when we go to assess and measure a space, we've typically done that by um, hand measuring with either lasers or um, literally tape measurements and, and um, you know writing everything down on paper. And then we would hand that information on to our drafts team. And you know guys like me would uh, basically remodel the entire building in Revit um, or AutoCAD or even SketchUp. And what the work that Emily is doing, that doesn't need to happen anymore. We don't need to go and hand measure or use lasers or write down dimensions. The work that Emily's doing with reality capture means the entire space is captured, um, even the duct work, the ceiling work, and, and even uh, very fine details like the kitchens, lighting. Um, it's quite fantastic. Now, what's really important is that we can start to modify this space. And so me and Emily just did a project together where in one of these captures, the client wanted to see a kitchen mock-up. And I'll bring that in. So the projects that we do, be it in Revit or SketchUp, we can start to interact and overlay those designs. And so we can start to do things like testing out new design layouts all in the actual space. So we can see here, I modeled this kitchen here in Revit. Um, some people can probably recognize the cabinets and the sinks. And so it's really nice that instead of having to rebuild the entire space, we can just introduce elements. We can design very quickly over top of it. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna bring in some desks. And let's just go over here to the office here. I'm just gonna do a very quick staging. So we end up working with commercial real estate agents and even potential tenants. So we'll go in and we'll quickly stage one of these reality captures just to determine if there is program fit, to determine if there's an opportunity um, for these tenants to go ahead and actually move in. And I'm just gonna drop the graphics here. There we go. And I'm just going to do a little, you guys can just watch, just sit back and watch. And I'm pretty much just going to decorate the space. Add just like little elements here. 
On the GeoPogo platform, we've ended up adding all kinds of assets, furniture assets, lighting, and we're even starting to work with furniture manufacturers to start to bring in professional office equipment from Kimball um, and others that are all around the, uh, especially around here in the Bay Area, we've been starting to work together 3D models and assets in here. And so we can go in and say we pop another desk in here. And exactly. And I think that, Mike, if I can jump in, yep. um, what's so amazing about this is that there's there's different kinds of vacant space. There's there's a lot of space that is already furnished or is second generation office space uh, where people are having a very difficult time visualizing it. That's one of the issues is just, you know, how do I make sure that this space is going to work for me? And then the other, and this for leasing. Um, and then the other side of the equation right now, which is so timely, is that everyone is trying to understand um, how do I get back to work? How do I re reconfigure my office for my team? Um, so I think that the, um, the opportunity, of course, to kind of work in tandem with reality capture plus the virtual staging. Um, and the AR mode, which then, you know, has always been able to, um, you know, it's been a feature we've had for a long time, but I think that people haven't realized how relevant it is until now. Um, yep. I think that that is sort of what is making this all come together so nicely, um, which was dr a dream five years ago, um, but now is a reality. And I think that that's one of the things that is so exciting to me because I know just based on my own data with my company um, and then around the world, how much scanning is happening, how much people are needing to, and, and they're doing these high-end scans and virtual tours, but I feel like they don't even understand how amazing it can be if you go one step further or two steps further and start to, you know, use the 3D data not just yep. the not just the visuals because the, a panorama you you know you could use a 360 all in one camera and get a panorama and we can virtually stage that but it's baked in um what what mike is illustrating is yep. this um you know this more computational more um configurator approach to it um that can happen in real time and that's what i think is extremely exciting about all of this exactly and yeah, there's there's just so much, especially as we start to bring in the collections of 3D office furniture that is available online, and you're really bringing it and centralizing it into one place. So, um, you know, whether you're a designer, uh, commercial real estate agent, or somebody who leases space, you can quickly come in, take the reality capture that Emily and her team provides, and do a quick staging, um, which saves a great deal of time and money because you don't need to remodel the space. You don't need to remodel it and rev it or SketchUp, um, it's here and it's as perfect as it's gonna be, especially um, as Matterport continues to refine their OBJ exports, these will be beautiful. These will be um, just as perfect as the 360 captures that are done. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Mike. I'd love to, um... I'd love to jump back to my slides and then come back to this um, uh, in the maybe in the Q&A uh, for people to ask some more questions. Is that OK? Fantastic, guys. OK, thank you so much. So OK, you all can see me now, see my slides? Not yet, Emily. OK. show my screen okay have this thing again main screen just a window i think i have to do the uh, main screen showing again but that's fine so uh, again this is where we were we were looking at um reality capture um and what 3d enables um again this is back to my philosophy on you know we have to document um obviously in the age of covid it's mo it's even more important than it ever was before um, because it helps us to um, reduce the amount of physical travel people have to do to go to a certain space, sort of, you know, my team or anyone that goes out as, um, as an essential worker to capture and, and document a space is doing that on their behalf. Um, but it enables all of these incredible things for augmented reality, virtual reality, extended reality. 
um, which which the 3D model then becomes part of that, the timestamp of that property and part of that property's history um, and potentially even its first digital twin. So it's, it's very first um, 3D representation that is used for something beyond um, just uh, you know, the, uh, the design, but actually potentially used for uh, maintenance or used for um, you know, t ticket requests or, or, you know, communicating with your coworkers or virtual experiences that, that will be enabled by this. So here are the things that, of course, more mapping, storytelling, marketing, um, that this will enable. And then it becomes this foundational cornerstone of spatial computing, which is really um, us having that digital representation and being able to interact with it um, uh, in any space. Um, so the computer really becomes part of our environment. And that's, I think, really important that the 3D representation or the 3D data itself is sort of that, that foundational piece for um, being able to move into uh, more spatial computing, um, more spatial computing uh, offerings. And so we're not quite there yet. It's coming, but I, I, it's not quite there yet. So I like to talk about spatial computing just sort of more vaguely because, uh, you know, there's it's harder to give specific examples, but I do have an example I can show. Um, this is again, um, Mike, when we were doing our um, our tests for that kitchen, for the kitchen he talked about, and this is the final render that was just delivered um, to the client from Mike's um, from Mike's uh, work and GeoPogo's work. So this is the the final kitchen that we delivered to our client in San Francisco today. Um, and so I don't talk a lot about the spatial computing, but I want to just show you um, exactly um, what we did, for instance, with Spatial First, which is the other company that I built. Um, and this is using um, a mobile interface to interact with some of these 3D objects and to create more st storytelling opportunities. So um, using a, a, an iOS device, and uh, approaching a commercial offering, a commercial real estate offering with a, uh, you know, showing the 3D hypotheticals, mixed reality, augmented reality in on an iPad for a client to be able to jump into um, whether it's a hypothetical that they want to show or whether it's reality capture, um, giving somebody that, that spatial interface for interacting with uh, that 3D content. Um, so we that's the place time app, and this is just a preview uh, of what we did and what we've built. Um, that again takes all of the 3D and AR and and takes it another step further, which is to have a full fully spatial interface. Um, so I have a bit of a 2020 outlook to share with you guys um, that I will see, and I think we will all see reality capture begin to be something that is used not just for real estate, but um, for so many different kinds of spaces, um, educational um, spaces, university schools, uh, venues, event spaces. Um, as I already mentioned, it's a three to four times growth just in Q2. So I really think that this is going to be a trend that will continue, um, you know, for the foreseeable future. I think that marketplaces for real estate are going to explode. Um, specifically, ones that have access to the best 3D content and the best visualizations. Uh, I think workplace re-envisioning is going to be absolutely massive. It's it's a pain that is universally shared by anyone who has a, an office that they lease for their team or for anyone who owns an office building or manages an office building. Um, I think that digital twins to be able to have remote um, office operations or to potentially have better ways to work remotely uh, will be something that we will continue to see in 2020 and beyond. Um, and again, just coming back to um, 3D documentation and reality capture is going to enable um, all of these amazing XR opportunities. And especially because the price of scanning and creating the point cloud um, has dropped significantly and the time that it takes to create uh, OBJs and other um, data sets that can be used at an efficient price, like it has, it has completely changed um, in the last, uh, you know, couple years. So, um, yeah, so I guess the question is now instead, you know, 
a, what the, the built environment tells a story. Um, it's not what do we want to tell with it, but what do you want to tell with it? And you know, how will you use these tools to um, to tell new stories? So, thank you. Thank you, Emily. It was a great presentation. And we have a question from the audience from uh, Gabriele. He's asking, how do you match holograms with 3D scans to get that AR digital twin render? How do I match? Um, could you repeat the question again? So yes. How do you match holograms with 3D scans to get that AR digital twin render? Um, so holograms, <laughs> I mean, the, it depends on how you are going to view a hologram. Uh, typically, a hologram, the way I imagine it, and maybe the, the person who asked the question could also talk about this a little bit more, but um, typically that would be in more of a wearable device, like so in a Magic Leap or in a HoloLens. Uh, and so those are things that you know you would be able to, you can place that content um, if you have scanned in real time a lot easier. So you may not even, need that digital twin if you're able to place the content just um, by by starting off by scanning in a wearable device like a, a hololens or any other de uh, device that has depth capture uh, built into the device itself um but you you know it's it's not as so much a hologram when it's um so that's one one version of hologram another hologram of course is to use something like light field capture um, which is another version of sort of uh, reality capture um, using a lot of uh, photographs or um, similar to photogrammetry um, that also creates a hologram. Um, and then the 3D, the 3D model that's created from the light field capture can be used very similarly, exactly like any of these other 3D models and combined to form new visualizations. So I think of sort of a hologram as being just um, another type of reality capture or another type of, of uh, visualization. Interesting. Thank you for your answer, uh, Emily. And actually, I have a question for you and, uh, and Michael. Uh, how easy it is to manipulate um, the environment once it's scanned before it gets converted into an OBJ and then imported into your app? Because I'm assuming you guys yeah. are importing an OBJ model from a matter port from a Matterport scan, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so everything we want to clean in. up this, this space before uh, dropping a, a brand new kitchen. Can we remove part of that scan uh, to make it cleaner? I mean, if you have the skills to do that, absolutely. I mean, I know that a lot of people will, for instance, drop, uh, you know, drop models into uh, Blender or they will use other software to clean it up. Um, I, I try to sort of do the, the hard work in the beginning. So I do most of the work to try to, to make sure that my OBJ is as clean as possible before I process it. So that means that the method of capture is different uh, because I will scan more densely. Um, I will scan under things, around things. Um, remember, the camera is only going in one direction, even though it spins. It's only really getting that surface, and so you, you need to be able to um, thoroughly scan a space to capture it well in 3D, and that will result in the best OBJ um, because it's harder to, to work on it in post than it is to try and just you know start with something good um, before you get that OBJ. Thank you. That's right, and sometimes I'll take uh, the material files. Uh, that come from the scans, and you can quickly touch them up in Photoshop too if you want. Mm -hmm. You can brighten them if there's any. Let's say there was a hole in the drywall, you can uh, you can just quickly you know in Photoshop patch it up kind of thing. Nice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The kitchen that Michael and uh, that Mike and I delivered uh, today um, has currently has a giant hole in the wall. So that's that's exactly the, the, the perfect example is when something is under construction and, and uh, you know, so we do need to show something else. But I think what makes it different is that, you know, it's not, it's we're not just doing Photoshop, we're also, you know, giving somebody AR tools so that if they're standing in the space, um, they don't have to just look at a picture, they can look at the AR um, you know, they can look at the kitchen in AR and place it in the space. Yeah. So it's giving Absolutely. everybody, giving you a range of ways to interact with that content. 
Super. Let's see if there is any other question for Emily and Michael. Um, I don't see any, but we have we do have a question for Matthew, for Professor Matthew. Um, I see that he has already responded in the in the question panel. Uh, I don't know if mm, Professor, do you want to elaborate more? Uh, if so, uh, feel free to speak. Um, um, I think I think I've answered the question in the question panel. Um, however, I'm, if if I can be um, provided with the um, ability to share my screen again, I've got a, a sort of a nice bit of symmetry to um, to link my presentation with Emily's. So if that's if that's possible, absolutely, it's coming your way. Okay. Okay. So my last the last slide, which hopefully you can see um, mm -hmm. on screen. Um, I actually showed to the right a timber, an optimized timber truss, which I didn't have time to talk about. Um, but um, that timber truss is now in our laboratory. So um, Emily mm -hmm. talked about education as being a growth vertical for um, reality capture. So this is uh, basically we can, we can find uh, this timber truss, which is now situated in the laboratory. I'll just head over to um, a good vantage point. Um, and what I was going to say about this, this timber trust, but I've got much more uh, scope to talk about it now because we can actually get up close and personal, was that in some cases, these complicated structures, um, there's no cost penalty. So these complicated joints in timber actually is no more difficult to make a timber joint that looks like this compared with a timber joint that looks like um, the one on a much more boring conventional structure. In terms of this 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 scan, it was done just before lockdown. We didn't know anything about COVID lockdown, but it's been really really valuable for the last uh, three or four months. So people planning tests, we've come back to this time and time again, and uh, you know, could we fit this here? How will how will it work? We've not been physically allowed in this building until Tuesday this week. So for four months, we were not allowed in the building. For university wouldn't let us come in. This has been an absolute um, <laughs> um, godsend. So I think there were, there were, there were, I would just just echo um, what Emily's been talking about. There's huge uh, opportunities and you know the rooms yeah. and things we can wander and around. Have you used the um, Professor Gilbert, Gilbert, have you used the uh, measurement tool? So. On the left, down in the bottom corner there, you have a measurement tool. Have you played with that um, in order to illustrate the size or to show scale to people? Yeah, we have, because we're looking at um, um, some equipment coming in in, in in the far corner, and we were looking yeah. at, uh, um, so we looked at a planned view, got the tape measure, and um, and worked out that, that the equipment could fit. So yeah, we've been using it both qualitatively, but also quantitatively um, as well. So anyway, I thought that was a, a, an opportunity, That's too good an opportunity to, to, to yeah. miss. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a great coincidence. And I think it just illustrates, you know, and obviously now we are standing in Sheffield um, in your laboratory. And if we if we went uh, one step further, you know, and, and you shared the link with all of us, we could view it in VR, you know? So I think that, um, you know, that's what's so awesome about it is that, um, you know, we can really give somebody a sense of immersion and, and uh, education. And it just, you know, it, and it doesn't have to be Matterport, right? So I want to also say Matterport is one of many other ways that this is accomplished. But um, but I do think that it just it neatly and, and easily shows um, how we need to have better ways to communicate with each other. And this this enables that. Um, so thank you so much for sharing this. No worries. Thank you, Professor. And I would also like uh, to read the question that you answered out loud in case um, the other people in the audience uh, might not be able to see it. So Isis asked, uh, using the Peregrine app, can the tension, compression, and bending values be exported? And within the optimization, can a limit be placed on each of these values? And your answer was, of course, yes, they can be exported uh, and also limits can be placed. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, the other thing is obviously the area and the cross-section details of, of the members. 
it can be exported or or it can be passed on to other tools in 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 a in a workflow so it can be moved on to other grasshopper plugins for example uh, caramba is is widely used for, for structural analysis um and you know, so so potentially you can have a whole tool chain um or you can use it in isolation just for a concept design so it it's 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 up to you, it's up to you really um i think in, increasingly it, it's going to be um a whole tool chain for now probably it's primarily used to just just for concepts but as it gets more sophisticated potentially um i think it will be used uh, as the first part of a of a continuous continuous thread if you like nice it's eight minutes past one um we had some great presentations today um i hope everyone enjoyed it uh, i want to thank um Professor Gilbert, uh, Emily Ullman, and Matthew Hoppy for being with us tonight, uh, today actually, for uh, UK viewers is actually tonight. evening <laughs> tonight. Um, so that's one another great thing about technology that you know connects people uh, in many different places around the world. Um, so thank you again, every, everyone. I just w would like to remind that this, pres this presentation is being recorded and it will be available soon on our YouTube channel. Uh, and I want to apologize because we had a, a small technical issues at the beginning. Um, the audio, we uh, were not broadcasting audio for the first couple of minutes of Professor Gilbert's presentation, but we will make sure that the audio uh, gets into the recording. So thank you again. I'm going to end this meeting and I hope everyone stays safe. Thank you, Enrico. Thank, thank you, you, SFCDI. Bye. Thank you.